Welcome to the Things I Wish I'd Known podcast, where guests share learning from life experiences to help others on the same path. Hello and welcome back to Things I Wish I'd Known. It's Sophia Giblin here, your podcast host. This week I had the absolute pleasure of speaking with Natasha Devon, MBE. So Natasha is a mental health activist and campaigner. You'll hear all about her work in this interview on this episode of the podcast. And this podcast is absolutely brilliant for anybody who's working with children and young people. Natasha works really closely with teenagers and in schools. So she's got loads of top tips and advice for how you can support young people's mental health. So hope you enjoy. I'm really happy today to have Natasha Devon here with me. Hi, Natasha. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So Natasha, you're a mental health campaigner and activist um, and author. So you've got A Beginner's Guide to Being Mental. Is that right? That was out last year? That's right, yeah. And your new book coming out next year as well? Yeah, I've got a book coming out in April for teenagers about exams and it's called Yes, You Can. Yes, you can. Mm. Yes, you can do it. Ace your exams without losing your mind. So uh -huh. the idea for the book came about because the research I was doing with teenagers they kept saying to me, I would rather get a really good grade and sacrifice my mental health than the other way around. And I thought the problem is this has been presented to them as a binary choice. And in fact, when you research it, you find that the things that you would do to look after your mental health also make you a more effective learner. They mean that you're um, firing on all cylinders cognitively and you can remember things more easily and, and stuff that will help you in an exam. So I thought someone needs to write a book and tell them this because they've been misinformed. So that yeah that's what the book's all about wow that's really interesting that they they feel like it's one or the other right well it's because of the nature of the curriculum and how squeeze schools are for time mental health has been tacked on as an afterthought so they see it as separate from their academic studies oh right i see so you can see where the problems are coming from then yeah in, um, yeah so that's education. why we need to redesign the curriculum but until that happens mm -hmm. there's this book oh brilliant right well, everyone should be going out to buy that then <laughs> <laughs> next year <laughs> but as well as as being an author and an activist and a campaigner you also you have a podcast, don't you? Fact or bull? That's right. Yeah, it, I present that with Dr. Keon West, who is a social psychologist at Goldsmith University. And every week we take a statement that a lot of people believe is true. And we invite an expert into the studio to debate whether that statement is fact or bull. But the podcast is completely misnamed because... <laughs> Virtually every week, we've concluded that it's neither fact nor bull, and in fact, the truth is somewhere in the nuance in between those two perspectives. Oh, really? Yeah. So, what sorts of things are you talking about? So, we have things like um, being fat makes you automatically unhealthy, um, gender is a social construct, um, getting naked can be a feminist act. We did that with Dr. Victoria Bateman, that's been my favorite episode so far, I uh -huh. think. Um, yeah, we, we try to cover a lot, but I guess if you had to knit them all together, the themes would be, we talk a lot about equality, both racial and gender equality, and we do a lot of stuff that would be relevant to parents, because um, Keon is a parent and I work with young people. Mm, okay, fascinating. Well, I need to definitely have a listen to that. It Please really do. really good. <laughs> yeah, and I also am interested in that. Um, yeah, what the findings are, I suppose. So is it sort of based on science, I guess, if you're working with him? We, we try to take a scientific approach to it because uh, I think what's happened with uh, politics and social media is it's become very team orientated and you have to pick a side and be slavishly um, devoted to that side regardless of what evidence is presented to you. And the podcast was really about saying... You know, no one's a hero or a villain. No perspective is 100% right or wrong. But what you do is you apply a, a logical questioning mindset and you cherry pick the things that will help you to improve your understanding. And it's, it's I guess, trying to make critical thinking sexy. Mm. <laughs> Challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. So, so you had, um, was it Rachel Riley on That's recently? Right. Yeah. yeah. She was talking about um, women in STEM because obviously she's a mathematician and what was really interesting I thought was she was talking about the need to humanize scientists because she was saying that they've they've done this experiment for decades now where they've asked children to draw a scientist and regardless of the gender of the child um, about 90% of them draw a man in a lab coat 
And she was saying part of the problem is that we see scientists as being almost robots. Like they, they can't have a personality. And because there's this stereotype that women are very emotional, we see that as being incompatible with science. But she said, you know, some of the, the best scientists I know that are women what makes them good at their job is that they're passionate and that's just another way of branding emotional and if you understood them as people in a three-dimensional way you would see that their personality is not a um a barrier to them being able to do their their job effectively Mm, mm. so i guess it's the media right that's the media and just general i think stereotypes that exist all around us and i was discussing this with someone on twitter today actually where they were saying that they felt that a lot of the the work that had been done in challenging gender stereotypes was being undone recently. And I wonder whether that's true or whether we're just more tuned into it now. Okay. So we notice the conversations people are having. It's on our radar. Mm. And and it's that confirmation bias thing, isn't it, where you go, oh, here's a person who is espousing views which I want to challenge and I'll kind of bank that and use it to... um, inform my opinion of what's happening in the world Mm, okay so your job really is to challenge views break down stereotypes yeah and just get people thinking you know if they go away thinking that was an interesting discussion job done really Mm. oh good well yeah definitely we'll have a listen to that (laughs) Um, so you've worked with um, Dr. Keon West. Is that That's right. I'm saying it right. Yeah. Um, as well on Naked Beach. That's Why right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because it sounds really interesting. So Keon did a piece of research which was published in the Journal of Happiness, and he theorised it was a thought experiment more than a real experiment although he did do lots of controlled tests but he theorized that if you take somebody with very low body image satisfaction and you expose them to a range of different body shapes of people who are naked it will improve their body image and therefore their self-esteem and therefore ultimately their life satisfaction and this fantastic production company called Bareface TV, which is run by two women who, um, they, they were working for a different production company, but they did that show. Do you remember um, Snog, Marry, Avoid? Yes. Yeah, they did that show. <laughs> and um, they uh, were really interested in exploring this idea and what it would look like in reality. So what we did is we took eight body positivity campaigners, some of whom are already have a, a huge following. So for example, Felicity Hayward is one of them who is a a plus size model she's got hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram but they they were male female um, wide range of shapes sizes and colors uh, we had a guy called Dan who um, has a disability he was in the army and he uh, he lost an arm and, and part of his shoulder trying to represent as many different bodies as we could and we sent people who had really low levels of body image satisfaction but they didn't have a diagnosable mental illness to go and live on a Greek island with these eight people for a week and they were naked throughout and then their challenge was if they felt comfortable they had to get naked themselves by the end of the week okay and that was the show (laughs) (laughs) And what happened? Well, no. it, it's, I mean, you can find it on 4OD okay. and uh, there's actually, we're on a series break at the moment, so there'll be two more episodes which will be going out at some point. I'm not sure when yet. Um, people chose to uh, be varying degrees of naked. So some people chose to keep their, their pants on. Um, some people got totally naked. But it was more a symbolic thing that as they were shedding layers of clothes, because, you know, some of them, they were turning up to this Greek island and it's, boiling hot and they're swathed in all these layers of black garments because in a way they kind of represented the layers of insecurity that they were immersed in Mm. and then as the show's going on we we designed kind of bespoke activities for them to do that would play into the things that they told us that they were struggling with and as the week goes on you you see they're wearing more colorful garments they're they're wearing less things that are appropriate for the beach you know and if even for some of them getting into a, a swimsuit or a bikini was a, a huge deal mm. so i guess that the getting naked at the end even though that's the the selling point of the show because people like to see naked people um, <laughs> just fact <laughs> it was you know it was more of a symbolic gesture it was it mm. represented their journey mm. 
Okay, interesting. Oh, can't wait to check that out as well and see what happens. <laughs> is it almost like, you know, if, if you see other people accepting their body, essentially it should be easier for you to accept yours too? Well, it, I always describe it as the counterpoint to what we currently face. Okay. If you think about what we're exposed to through advertising, billboards, magazines, bus stops, <laughs> social media, all around us, when we see bodies, they have been photoshopped and perfected, and we only really still tend to see one very narrow idea of what it means to be beautiful. And we know that that has a measurable negative impact on the way that people feel about themselves. So it's that, but flipping it on its head, essentially, and, and asking what would society look like if the range of bodies we were exposed to were more diverse. Mm, yeah, really important work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit then about how you came into this line of work, of campaigning and working with children and young people? Um, well, I recovered from an eating disorder when I was 25 and I didn't have a job because I was too poorly to work and it just so happened that the therapist who treated me who specialized in addiction actually so I had bulimia which is I think closer to addiction than anorexia which is more like OCD okay. if you're going to compare it to something else mm -hmm. um, so this this addiction therapy really worked for me and the therapist that I had that with was looking for a receptionist so I said oh if I come and work on reception can I learn more about the work that you do and maybe sit in on some of your sessions if you know you have permission from the, the patient and I did that for a year and whilst I was working there I came up with this idea I thought um, somebody should really be going into schools and talking about mental health in a way that's universal because when I was at school when we had PSHE lessons on mental health, it was always that thing of, I don't know if you had this, but you know, get the person who has a really interesting but quite extreme story to share. Okay. And they do almost like a TED Talk style thing where they, they talk about their lowest point and it's really inspirational, but what you won't do is you won't apply that to yourself mm. because you think, oh, that will never happen to me. And I thought, what would have helped me was to understand that everybody has mental health and that our objective levels of mental well-being will fluctuate throughout our lives and whilst you can't ever guarantee that you can prevent mental illness you can keep your levels of mental fitness high you know there are things that you can do mm. to um, have a relationship with your mental health and nurture it so I thought what I've got to understand is what young people want to learn about Okay. So I, I went back to my old school, which was an all-girls school. And then we have a brother school, an all-boys school, which is just down the road. And I interviewed 250 teenagers in each school, 500 altogether. And I asked them, if you could have a PSHE lesson on anything, what would you pick? And overwhelmingly, the most popular answer was body image. And you have to bear in mind, I'm 38 now, so this was 13 years ago. This was a, a kind of cultural landscape before Gok Wan. <laughs> so for them to be saying, I want to learn about body image and how to love my body, was actually quite a radical thing. It wasn't on the, the radar in the way that it is now. So I thought, okay, I can do that. So I went away and I found some, um, uh, some experts in that area. I attended loads of conferences and I interviewed lots of academics. And I came up with this lesson plan and started taking it into schools. And around the same time, I reconnected with an old school friend called Ruth Rogers, who had just started a charity called Body Gossip. And Body Gossip had this really interesting concept where they asked the public to submit their body story. And that could be in the form of a poem or a piece of script or an essay. And then Ruth, who was uh, still is an actor, she would get her mates essentially some of whom were quite famous actors to perform those stories in in theater shows and we kind of joined forces and those lessons that i'd been teaching became the body gossip education program so i did that for a few years but then as i was touring schools i realized that it, the problem with being a charity is that you have this mission statement and 
I'm sure you know this, you can't really deviate from it. Mm -hmm. Everything has to fit with the mission statement. Mm -hmm. And Body Gossip's mission statement was very much rooted in body image. And I had teachers saying to me, I'd love for you to do something like this, but about self-harm or um, stress and anxiety. And I couldn't do that whilst I was working for Body Gossip. So I... Uh, Ruth and I parted ways, not in a bad sense at all, um, but just because I wanted to um, expand the, the repertoire of what I was doing and started tackling other topics. Um, and that was, I think, 20, 2014. So, yeah, I've been doing that for a very long time. Um, and I visit an average of about three or four schools a week throughout mm-hmm. the UK and, and sometimes beyond throughout the world. Amazing. It's a very long-winded answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> it's good. That was the answer I was looking for, a long-winded one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to know all the details. <laughs> because, so, I'd be really interested to hear then what you think the changing landscape of mental health looks like in schools across your career, I guess. Mm. It was very different. Mm. When I first started going into schools, it was pre-Michael Gove. Okay. So there was... Not that I appreciated this at the time because you don't know what you've got till it's gone, but there was a lot more scope to do things around uh, drama and dance and art and sport, which we know have a positive therapeutic effect. And there was also, there were more school counsellors. There was a a budget for PSHE. So when I first started, um, about 60% of my business came from state schools and about 40% from independent schools. And I noticed that that balance was starting to tip. And I thought, when you consider that independent schools are only about 7% of schools, Mm. I thought this is really disproportionate and I don't want my lessons to become a a thing that is exclusively for rich children. So now what I have to do is I invite the independent schools that I go into to pay a voluntary subsidy which allow me to go into state schools for free because state schools don't have a PSHE budget. And sometimes they're saying, oh, I've borrowed this money from, you know, the sport department who can't afford it yeah. to invite you in. And, you know, I would love to be able to work for free, but ultimately, until I can persuade 25,000 people to sponsor me a pound a year just for being me. And that, <laughs> I think you could do that. Gonna have it. I'll pay you a pound. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that um, so that's definitely changed. And... I would say as well, young people are a lot more emotionally literate. Mm-hmm. So I work predominantly with teenagers, although I do do a bit of work in primary schools as well. And there's a lot less stigma mm-hmm. than there was. And children are, generally speaking, much better able to articulate to me what they're going through. What they don't have is the support and the services in place. Mm-hmm. And you're finding a lot of children are kind of bottlenecking be- because they have needs over and above what their teachers can help them with, but they've been turned away from CAMS or there's no social services or educational psychologists or anyone else really that can give them the support that they need. So they're just in this sort of purgatory. Yeah, that's the the most difficult bit, isn't it? I think it's, and it's knowing that mental health problems get worse Mm. the longer that you leave them, right? So if you leave kids in this purgatory, we know that the outcomes are probably nearly always going to be worse. And you can understand why CAM say we have to prioritise the most severe cases. But from a financial point of view, as much as anything else, you know, you know if you catch things in their early stages, it's easier to manage and treat. So it makes no sense that those services were defunded. I mean, they they weren't they never had loads of money, but they've been cut by I think about eighty five million since twenty ten. Wow, mm. it's tough, isn't it? I remember when I set up the charity in about two thousand eleven, thinking, looking back on it now, thinking there was so much mm. yeah. <laughs> in comparison. Yeah, um, it's just so different now. And you, I often leave a school thinking, who do I pass the ball to? Right. Because, you know, I'll have conversations with young people and, they, and I'll go, right, I, I think I know what they need. Um, and before I could identify who it was that I should, you know, which team I should pass them on to or alert or, you know, if there was a safeguarding issue or, or whatever. And now I, I think, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know whether they're going to get it. Mm. And that's a horrible feeling because, you know, for my own mental health, I have to close the school door and shake it off. Yeah. But then at the same time, you can't help but wonder what's going to happen to them. 
yeah and you can't yeah at the same time do everything for that that child young person can you and it takes a whole team around a child to yeah to do the work yeah, absolutely if, if it's not the team then that's when it's yeah difficult and you you see so much more being expected of teachers like it, the amount of round tables I've been to with uh, you know government representatives being like oh teachers would be well placed to do that and I remember I got into real trouble when I was the government's mental health champion I tweeted David Cameron because there was this news story and they said that they were I don't think this ever went ahead but for inner city London schools they were asking teachers to patrol bus stops to prevent knife crime what? and <laughs> gang uh, crime after school oh right and and I'm like <laughs> I actually sent a tweet to David Cameron saying shall teachers just shove a broom up their ass and sweep the floor while they're at it <laughs> which he didn't reply to uh, but I did get a call from the department saying can you delete that maybe but it's like how many more things over and above the remit of their job of actually teaching yeah. are they going to be expected to do yeah absolutely and so what do you think it is that teachers can do well, the, the way I frame it, there are three levels to mental health care. You've got what's often called prevention. I don't like that because it, it works on the basis that it's only relevant if you're going to get a mental illness. So I prefer to call it promotion, promotion of good mental health mm. at the bottom. And then at the top, you've got care for diagnosable mental health issues. In the middle, you've got um, sort of mental health first aid. So it's spotting the symptoms and knowing how to have a conversation about it and knowing where to signpost that person to and if all the services work the way they're supposed to teachers are actually really well placed to be in one and two mm. it's the third one that they should never be expected to to go into but because the services aren't there to meet the needs at the third tier everybody is getting stuck in in that second tier i also think there's a lot of opportunities to incorporate consideration of mental health into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. We do it with physical health all the time because it's a part of our culture to consider our bodies constantly. There's all kinds of things that, like for example, in IT, you can talk about screen addiction. Um, in PE, you can talk about endorphins and what they do for your chemical balance and how they help to keep you feeling well. In English, you know, I struggle to think of a single Shakespearean character who doesn't have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about, you know, Hamlet and psychosis. And Romeo and Juliet is not a love story. It's a story about two young people who take their life. Mm -hmm. you know, there, yeah. There's all these opportunities that if you give teachers a little bit more time and space and autonomy to normalize that conversation so that by the time you're having those assemblies you've already got to a point where they know a little bit about it and the groundwork has been done mm. so is this something that you promote at the minute it was something you've seen done in school i don't want to add to teachers to-do lists that's yeah. the problem and and i think you know the curriculum people keep sticking extra bits on it but at its heart hasn't really changed for a hundred years and if you think about how different the world is to how it was a century ago my sense is that the curriculum is no longer really fit for purpose we're trying to sort of bash a square peg into a round hole mm. and the best thing that an education secretary could do would be to completely scrap it and redesign yeah. it but with proper experts not politicians <laughs> with an agenda <laughs> like proper people who know stuff but that requires so much work and also politicians tend to think in four-year cycles yeah. so you know what a secretary of state wants to leave their stamp on something but they don't want to put in a load of work for which they won't be acknowledged or they won't see the results for another decade or so i don't know realistically whether that would happen but i, I sense that that's what needs to happen and that's why we need a revolution we need a revolution yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i heard something very interesting the other day someone was saying it made me think that our education system is really good for gearing children and young people up for the 20th century yeah <laughs> it's like oh uh, yeah actually that makes sense like everything's changing so fast now so much of the stuff that we're teaching is probably going to be slightly irrelevant like you, you and I will remember at school when they were like, 
you can't, you won't always have a calculator with you. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, like, literally, you've got a calculator in my pocket 24 7. So true. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's not really been updated, has it, to, to meet modern ne- the needs of today, I guess? No, and it's a, to an extent, I think, a reflection of what we value outside of education as well. You know, it, it, in the future, the jobs that are going to be the ones that we can do are the ones that robots can't. So anything that's creative, anything that involves caring, you know, mm. robots can't really do that. But at the moment, those are the least respected jobs. Mm. And you see that in the pay gap. You know, women disproportionately go into industries uh, like teaching, like caring, like nursing. And they're paid less because we don't value caring as a skill. And yet, it's going into the future. I think it's going to be one of the most valuable commodities. And it's sort of missing, isn't it? It's, or it's called soft skills. Mm. In education. I hate that. <laughs> a soft skill. <laughs> it's important, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but actually, if, that raises a good point about where we learn that. Because in an age of lots of mental health problems... Mm. If, if we're not getting the connection, right, if, if we're all addicted to screens or, you know, we don't have the human connection, it can be hard to learn those soft skills if you've not got the experience of what it's like to be on the receiving end of them. Mm. So we talk about this a lot with parents um, and children. That it's about how you connect with them and how you have that relationship because once you've got the relationship, everything else will blossom on top of it. But if the relationship isn't there, it's actually quite difficult then to know how to be caring or Mm. we see it quite a lot in schools and especially you know in primary schools with children who we might see for therapy where the the um the referral for the child is that they don't they don't have empathy Mm. or they don't understand their actions have consequences and actually i wonder how much of this is about the development of the brain and, and how much might be missing in terms of connection because of things like screen time yeah well there's there's such a thing as neuroplasticity so you will your brain will develop according to what you have been encouraged to practice (laughs) if you are a child who for whatever reason hasn't practiced empathy it's it's not something fundamentally wrong with you it's just that that part of your brain has been dormant and uh, you know again this plays into gender stereotypes as well because when we had Rachel Riley on the podcast she was talking about an experiment they did where Um, It was about spatial awareness. And as you might expect, men performed much better than than women. But then they reframed it as an empathy test. And they said, imagine you're this person and then move this object according to what they can see. And it was exactly the same task. But when they framed it as an empathy test, the women did much better than the men. And some people might argue that that's innate. But I think it's probably a reflection of what boys and girls are encouraged to practice from a really early age yeah that's so interesting aren't children gendered from very very early on is it's like two or three I think yeah well before that so um in my book uh, uh being mental I talk about there's a very famous experiment they did where they they got a load of babies uh, with permission and <laughs> just <laughs> hope so swipe them <laughs> uh, and they gender swapped their clothes so that the boys were wearing pink you know with a flower on their head and the girls were wearing blue and they brought in some adults who didn't know these babies and watched how they interacted with them and more eye contact was made with the babies who were dressed in pink um, they were comforted more if they fell over. They were more tactile with, with the pink babies. And then at the end, they asked all of the adults to pick. There was a, a kind of series of slopes. And they asked the adults to pick a gradient that they thought that their baby would be capable of crawling up. And the ones that were dressed in pink were put on very gentle slopes that they could easily manage. And the ones dressed in blue were put on uh, slopes that were too challenging for them. And you can't argue that that's anything to do with the signals being given by the baby because they gender swap the clothes. This was all to do with our inherent biases that I don't even think we know we're doing. But even, you know, 2019, I'm at that age where so many of my friends are having babies and you cannot find a gender neutral baby card. 
Really? You can't. Well, I found this card. It, you know, I had to visit about five card shops, and I found this card that said, "Some said on the front, some baby cards are pink, some baby cards are blue. They all make me sick. So here's a picture of a banana, <laughs> <laughs> which I ended up buying. Like all my friends." <laughs> Just stockpiling them. Yeah, but other than that, it's like, oh, you had a girl, cover it in glitter and yeah. you know, pink or, you know, boy. Here's a boy playing with a tiny tiger. Mm. It's so interesting. I went into a, a secondary school recently where they had toilets. They had male and female toilets, but on the doors they'd put the sign, you know, like the male sign with the circle and the cross or whatever, right. and the female sign that's the circle the, with the... Oh, so the male the, sign is you know it's I mean? got an arrow. Oh, the arrow, yeah, okay. That looks like an erection, right. that's how I remember uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this got me so confused because I went in the wrong one. Right. <laughs> but I was just thinking, how confusing is, is this <laughs> for people? I have no idea. But I guess, you know, what the experience of young people is like at school at the minute. Well, increasingly schools are have gender neutral toilets and yeah. just a cubicle for everyone. That would have been better for me. It seems sensible, <laughs> really. Because <Yeah. laughs> everybody has a gender neutral toilet at home, don't they? Yep, very true. And it teaches everybody that they need to leave the toilet as they would expect to find it. Yes, no matter who's coming in yeah. after you. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk a little bit about... Um, things that you wish you'd known then mm. so you've had a really interesting career and obviously something that you just touched on is you were appointed as the children's mental health champion for the government back in was it 2015 it was 2015 um so what are some of the things that that you know now at the point that you're at on your journey that maybe you wish you'd known a little bit earlier on i think the main thing i wish i'd known as a child is that nobody knows what they're doing <laughs> so when you're when you're a kid you think there's going to be this magic age I think I thought it was probably about 30 in my head where I'll wake up and I'll be a grown-up and everything will be easy and I'll fill up my tax returns and I'll iron you know I still don't iron but you know I'll iron my, my clothes and um, everything will just run smoothly because I'll be an adult with an adult brain who knows what she's doing and that point never arrives <laughs> you, just, yeah. you wake up every morning and go I'm just gonna wing it <laughs> I've yeah. got no idea <laughs> and everybody's doing that you know everybody's walking around winging it and the the people who appear most confident are the people who are best at covering up the fact that they have no idea what they're doing mm. and I wish I'd known that earlier and I wish I'd known that I was right about so many things that I was convinced by people who were older than me and therefore I thought must be wiser than me, I wasn't right about. And I thought, oh, one day I'll see it from their perspective. And now I'm the age they were. And I'm like, no, I was right. Mm. I was right. Um, and I think, it, you know, particularly when you're a teenager, which is the, the age that I work with, you're at this kind of perfect point in your brain development where you're old enough to understand how the world works but young enough to want it to change. So the teenagers I work with, they, are, they ask me really left-field questions, and they'll say, why do we do things like that? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just winging it. I yeah. don't know the answer. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> um, yeah, and you don't realise how much you're actually, because you're always dismissed as somebody who's idealistic or a teenager, or this idea that teenagers are selfish, I don't really know where that comes from. And you don't realise how much you were onto something. Mm. Yeah, and it's funny, isn't it? That I guess it, what is that fixed mindsets of people who are older than you, maybe thinking that they knew better. Perhaps um, I also think people get into routines. Um, the great thing about my job is I'm never allowed to get into a comfort zone, really, for two reasons. First of all, because I'm always traveling. So, for example, next month I'm going to a, a European school in Taiwan. Um, you know, I've been to, to Shanghai, to Thailand, to Nepal. Um, and, you know, if you'd have told me 10 years ago, you're going to get on a plane by yourself and turn up somewhere you've never been before. Um, I, that's not something that I could ever have imagined. So from, from that point of view, I'm always kind of challenging myself. But also, um, I'm very aware that I can't really have an off day. Because when I'm giving a talk in a school, it's another day at work for me, but I've got one hour of these young people's lives to get them thinking differently about something which might potentially affect everything they do. 
which is a lot of pressure. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. I always have to be in the room, <laughs> very yeah. in the room. And for that reason, I never get complacent. And But I do think that some people, they, they get into a routine and because they, they know, that, you know, I think I can do this, I think I can go from this home to this work to this social life, they get kind of stuck in, in that. So they appear to be very confident, but if you pluck them out of that and place them in somewhere unfamiliar, you'd realise they have no idea. Mm. Yeah, just winging it. <laughs> yeah, just winging it, yeah. <laughs> I know this sounds really trite, but we should be listening to young people about, you know, they're so cool with uh, gender mm. that to an extent I feel like I'm trying to catch up yeah. parents to where their children are at so you know it makes complete sense to me that a young person would say to me I don't identify as either male or female I'm non-binary or on some days I feel more male than female I'm gender fluid or whatever I'm like cool um, <laughs> and then parents they, and, and sometimes teachers cannot wrap their head around it mm. because they grew up in a world where they were taught there are two mm-hmm. and you, you know you can't deviate outside that but I think the world would be better. You know, the idea that there are two genders is a, a Christian idea that we we imposed on the rest of the world because of colonialism. So I think the world would be better if we went back to a system where we acknowledged that there's there's more than two genders. So I'm like, just do what your child is doing. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, follow their lead. <laughs> yeah. They're the future. <laughs> you made a really interesting point earlier when we when we were having a little chat actually about how children know this stuff right they know about stress and mental health but it's the adults that very often don't Mm. so you talk to them in schools and they'll be like yes we know yeah it's in schools i'm always having to think of innovative new ways to try and present the mental health discussion to them so increasingly i'm doing lessons particularly with sick formers around how your identity fits with your mental health and we're tackling things like gender sexuality race um but with parents like so for example one of the things that I would start a talk with is I say put your hand up if you've heard the one in four statistic and normally everyone's hands go up and I said right okay did you know that that's not right (laughs) so the one in four has been interpreted as one in four people will experience a mental health issue throughout their life but in fact when you look at the research it's in any given year one in four people is struggling actively with their mental health. Okay. So experts think throughout the course of a lifetime, it's much closer to half of people will at some stage experience a mental health issue. And when you bear in mind the massive range of mental health issues they are, everything from sort of extreme stress to bipolar disorder, or to, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress, to um, what's the one you get after you've had a baby? Oh, postnatal depression. Postnatal depression, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that makes... I'm surprised that it's not 100%, to be fair. Yeah. Um, And young people go, oh, yeah. (laughs) That makes sense. (laughs) When you say that to parents, they're like... (gasps) (laughs) You hear this collective gasp. And I'm like, right, this is really basic stuff. I've got to kind of dial this back. But the levels of stigma... And I think not without justification actually because you know the, what the evidence shows is for about 50 percent of people when you're talking about depression and anxiety which are the most common mental health difficulties 50 percent of people who have one episode of depression and anxiety recover and never relapse and the other 50 percent it's more of a ongoing thing but if it is an ongoing thing for you there are things that you can do to manage it you'll have good days and bad days but recovery is is possible and I think that going through a process of having therapy and understanding your brain better and how you function and how you connect to others makes you incredibly sane, actually. <laughs> Most of the people I know who are in recovery from mental illnesses are the sanest people I've met. Mm. So that label shouldn't mean anything, you know, in terms of your employability or your ability to perform or to be happy or successful. And yet we don't live in that world yet. And adults see that. They see the amount of stigma, for example, in workplaces. And they think, I don't want... Even though my child is cool with that label, they're still at school and they haven't experienced what that label means in the wider world. It's very easy to be diagnosed. It's less easy to reverse that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So I understand where the fear comes from. Mm. Yeah, I'd not really thought about it like that. Mm. Easy to be diagnosed and difficult to reverse it. Yeah. When I was working with children in my first job, I had to... 
I remember having to disclose whether I'd ever ha- had depression. Yeah. Or, and I was like, I remember writing on this form, yes, but I only thought that I had depression because I was dis- uh, prescribed antidepressants right. when my mum died because I was grieving. And, and now I can look back on that and go, that was grief. Like, mm. that was normal. It was okay to feel sad about that. Just needed to mo- move through it. Yeah. I didn't need the medication to... Yeah, you know, I wasn't actually depressed. Mm. So it's confusing, I think. Very when is. I was 16, that was very yeah. confusing. And there's a discussion at the moment about renaming post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic stress response. Oh. Because, you know, for a lot of people, you put themselves... You put any human in certain situations. You say abuse or trauma or, you know, the example that's always given is having to go to war or even having a car crash or something they're going to have that response Mm. it's a perfectly normal human response to the events around you but labeling it as a disorder suggests that it's something that originates within the individual as opposed to their circumstances yeah and just the normal response that you anyone would have exactly normal brain response yeah right I like that. I hope they do change that. Do you say they are going to? There's a discussion about it on social media, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah. (laughs) Everything's been overtaken by Brexit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This entire discussion has been irrelevant. (laughs) (laughs) No one's even listening. (laughs) Um, Well, thank you so much, Natasha. That's been really insightful, really interesting. It's lovely to speak to somebody who actually is in there with the kids. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You're right, you, you can't stop, you can't slow down, we can't stop listening to them, especially us who are maybe running organisations or um, providing services for children and young people, we need to know exactly what it is that they think yeah. and what it is that they want mm. and is how it, times are changing for them. It's really easy to go, I'll just do what I would have needed and I, yeah. I think that's useful to some degree but you have to check because the world changes so fast, you have to check that that would still be relevant to them. Yeah, totally. That's a really good takeaway for anyone who's listening. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to do something good. I should say. Yeah. Sorry. Please do. Um, if there are any people listening who work in education, um, if you go to my website, which is natashadevon.com, there are lots of free education resources and links to organisations that you can download. And there's also a page called Advice and Support, because um, the evidence shows if teenagers in particular, if they're concerned about their mental health, they're more likely to Google it than talk to their teachers or parents in the first instance and you just don't know what they'll find so I wanted to create somewhere where they know all the organizations there will provide them with safe support and advice um so yeah have, check oh, that out brilliant have yeah yeah I oh, will share that as well and um, we'll circulate on thank the, you. this podcast yes thank you so much Natasha lovely to speak to you today thank you I hope that you really enjoyed that episode. I had a great time chatting with Natasha. She really makes you think. She's definitely doing her job about helping people to think critically about how and why we do things. And so you can find her on Twitter at underscore Natasha Devon. Check out her books online and also her website once again is natashadevon.com. And thank you so much for tuning in today and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.